This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to the program. This is Rick Renner. It's the last week of the year, and I want to ask you, are you having a good week? You know, it's pretty cold in Moscow, and Denise and I, hey, sweetie, I'm glad you're in the program today. Thank you, Rick. When we came to the studio today, it was a burr. It was pretty yes. cold getting over here, but yes. it's my favorite time of the year. You know, people have different times of the year that are their favorite seasons. I love the fall. Denise, we've always loved the fall. Oh, well, we got married in the fall. We had Philip in the fall. We had Paul in the fall. We had Joel in the winter. In the winter. But we moved to the former Soviet Union in the dead of winter. Yes. I mean, it was cold when we moved minus, to this part of the world. Minus 20-something. I'll never forget it. And our first house didn't have any heat. Right. I mean, we were all just huddled together in that bed trying to get body heat so we wouldn't freeze during the night. But you know what? Those are precious oh, memories. Precious memories. And to this day, I just love the cold. Yeah. You know, Denise and I don't love hot weather or sun, so we kind of run from the sun. Either Other people go to the beach and lay on the beach. Not me and Denise. In fact, one time it was really funny. We went to Egypt. Now, I know that sounds exotic, but Egypt is only three hours from here. It's not far. It's not exotic. Millions of Russians go to Egypt for vacation. And we went to Egypt to take a cruise on the Nile. We took our kids. We have a photo of Denise that is hysterical. <laughs> now, on the deck of that little cruise ship were all these people sunbathing, hardly wearing clothes. Denise was completely decked in all kinds of layers. She had a hat on so big you couldn't even see that it was her and a blanket on top of all of that to make sure the sun didn't hit any of her skin. And she's laying there. I said, Denise, are you sunbathing? <laughs> <laughs> but we just really don't like hot weather. No, no. Well, no, I, I like hot weather. Not real, real, real hot. But I don't do the sun. In fact, I was telling somebody yesterday that we went to Israel one time and, and I said, I'm going to go out there on the beach and I'm just going to try to be like those other people. And I didn't have on a bathing suit, but I did have on, my skin was showing. And so I got me a cot and I'm laying there and I'm so white. I am so white. And I am laying there and I'm, I'm looking around at all these people and they're so brown and tan and all this. And I went, this isn't my place. And I, <laughs> I just got up and went back up into the room. <laughs> but Denise, right now, it is so beautiful in Moscow. It is beautiful. And in just a few days, we're going to have New Year's. Oh, the decorations. Oh, sometimes. I, wish, I wish you could see the decorations in Moscow. Now, one thing about New Year's is people have days and days off work. So Denise and I get in the car and we go downtown and we drive around to see the decorations. I, I'm not exaggerating. Mm -hmm. Am I exaggerating? I don't think you can exaggerate. They go on for miles, the decorations on the road, in front of the buildings. I mean, they're, they're huge decorations. Anything you've seen in New York City or anywhere else, just forget it. You have never seen anything like this. But they're not Christmas decorations. They're New Year's decorations. Massive, massive bulbs like would hang on a Christmas tree, but here they're New Year's trees. And New oh. Year's trees as big as monuments all over. And one year, oh, you know what they did? One year they brought so many trees from the forest that they rebuilt a forest right on the edge of Red Square and then decorated all of it. Yeah. I mean, you just have to see it to believe it anyway. That's not what we're here to talk to you about today, but... <laughs> Hey, we know it's the end of the year. We want you to have a good time. We're having a good time with our weather here. But today we're going to be talking to you about decisions that you need to be making. This is a time of the year when people are thinking, what kind of New Year's resolutions am I going to make? Well, we've already seen maybe you need to shed a few pounds. You can do it. We've already seen that maybe you need to start physically exercising. You can do it. And today we're going to talk about the third decision, but I want you to order the whole series. Now, today, Denise and I are just sharing with each other and with you, but there's a whole series I taught on this subject, and you really need this. It's one of my favorites, and it's called Decisions. Are you going to follow through 
this time. And it comes with a study guide that is just wonderful. Please order these. It'd be a great way for you to start the new year. And we're offering you the book, which is called The Point of No Return, Tackling Your New Assignment with Courage and Common Sense. Now today, we're going to deal with the decision to get your finances in better shape. You can do it. It'll be the point of no return, and you can tackle it with courage and common sense. You'll learn that from this book and from this series called Decisions. But today, I want to begin with our testimony about finances. You know, today, our ministry is solid. We handle ministry finances very, very responsibly. We have a testimony for being responsible with the funds that are entrusted to us. And because we've been faithful, God has entrusted to us more. The Bible says, if you're faithful over little, God will give you more. And God has increased us and increased us and increased us. And today we are very wise financial stewards to the glory of God. But it didn't start that way. I was raised in a home where we didn't have a lot of extra money. We were raised on a side of Tulsa, which was not the best side of Tulsa. And... Honestly, it was kind of the ghetto of Tulsa. When I think about where my grandparents lived and where my grandmother Gertrude lived and my grandmother Edie, by the way, I had seven living grandmothers. Denise, seven. You had one, right? I had one that I saw once a year. I had seven. Well, here, this is Christmas week. When I was a child, Christmas Day was like geriatric ministry. <laughs> we went from one old house to another old house to another old house. I mean, I could just list all my grandmothers. <laughs> if you don't have our book, Unlikely, get it because you'll laugh your head off when you read about all my grandmothers. But I loved every one of them. But they all lived in really bad places like Grandmother Bagley. She lived right by the railroad track. My parents, when they got married, lived in a chicken coop. I'm not kidding. And it's still there remarkably. It's horrible. My parents lived in a chicken coop. That's where they lived when my sister Rhonda was born. Rhonda was nearly born in a chicken coop. So that's how we grew up. And my father didn't know much about money. He struggled with money. The worst day of the week was Thursdays. Because Thursday was the day that daddy got paid. He worked at American Airlines. And he didn't make a very big salary and we would drive to Sand Springs, Oklahoma where there was a Safeway and it was the big event every week on Thursday night. We would go there to go shopping and after we bought our groceries, we'd come home and then uh, the tension would begin because daddy would go to his little desk and he would sit there and would just labor over the bills and labor over the finances. I mean, the tension was so thick you could nearly cut it with a knife in our house I just, I just didn't want Thursday to ever come because we were under such stress. And most of the time when I was growing up, I wore hand-me-downs from somebody else. We had a friend that had sons, and she always passed their clothes our direction. Only once in a while would I get something brand new, maybe a pair of jeans at the first of the year or maybe a pair of tennis shoes. You know, tennis shoes back in those days were the cheapest things you could buy. Today they're expensive. But back when we were kids, Tennis shoes, I mean, they were the cheapest things you could buy in jeans. We're talking about cheap, cheap stuff. But even that was a stretch for my parents. They loved us. They wanted to take care of us. But my father did not have a revelation about money. And so he passed all that worry and all that lack of understanding about money to me. Didn't teach me one thing about money. So when we got married, I carried all that ignorance into our marriage. Well, Denise didn't know a whole lot about money either. In fact, when she got married, she spent her entire personal fortune on what? I want to say it. I had, I had $85. It was my entire life savings, and I bought Rick's wedding ring that he has on. There it is, right there. This day. There's Denise's entire fortune. $85. $85, and bam, that's everything she had. So when we got married, we didn't have anything. So the church at that time was only paying me $50 a week full time because they felt like I needed to pay a price to show I was really serious about being a minister. Believe me, we paid the price. And then they raised us to, I think, $100 a week. And eventually, I think we were making six or $700 a month. And we were so dumb about money. We really didn't have any money. We didn't have enough money to pay our bills, but we'd go out to eat all the time. 
what money we did have, we'd spend on breakfast. And then we would give huge tips to these waitresses trying to win them to Jesus. Yeah, we wanted that woman to be, her name was Charlotte. With we wanted that woman hair. to be saved. Oh. She must have said, man, I've got a bunch of suckers that come here every Saturday because, I mean, we would leave her more, a tip bigger than the cost of the breakfast. We just didn't have any revelation about money. And then revelation. we had a car that was paid for because my dad gave us a car. Sold the car, actually traded it in on a Riviera. Do you remember Rivieras back in those days? Rivieras back in those days were expensive, luxurious cars. Oh, gorgeous, gorgeous cars. Our car barely made a down payment. And the only reason the guy did a deal with us is because he attended the church and he owned a uh, Oldsmobile. dealership, an Oldsmobile dealership. And he did a deal with us. And I remember him looking across the table saying, Rick, you know, you don't make a lot of money. Are you, sh are you sure you want to go into debt for this car? I said, ah, we can handle it. Oh, my goodness. What were we thinking? <laughs> so we bought that Riviera. We were so proud of it and then couldn't make the payments on it. So I drove it down the street to another place eventually and sold it to another parking lot and didn't even get enough money to pay the debt off over there. I mean, we were just messed up with finances because nobody had ever taught me anything about money. No. But Denise, we were sincere. We were just really dumb. We were, we were really dumb. And you weren't, tith you weren't tithing. I wasn't even tithing back in those days. And I was asking you about it. Oh yeah, you were. Well, that's another story. <laughs> but today, our story is very different. And you know us as being responsible, reputable people, and we really are, I believe, before God and before man, that we have done what is right, and we built a ministry which is very well established. We have all kinds of advisors, and our board of directors is just fabulous, and we make solid decisions and don't do anything that is financially silly because money is very serious. But we had to make a decision to get a grip on it and learn something about money. And I want to read a verse to you. In Philippians 3.13, the Apostle Paul says this, Brethren, I count on myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind. behind. And that word, forgetting the Greek word, epilanthanomai, listen to what it means. To turn away from and forget. To put aside. To deliberately ignore. To purposefully disregard and completely forget about. It denotes something that may have really been true in the past, but it's no longer applicable. It depicts something finished, done with, obsolete, and hence no longer applicable. And we had to come to a place in our life where we said, you know what, we're done living in poverty, and we're done being dumb about money. We're going to say goodbye to that. That is obsolete, and from this moment forward, that is not who we are. And friend, I'm telling you, it literally happened in a second. It did. It in happened in one second. We got in God's will. We got in the right place, the right state to live in. As we were driving across that border, Rick said to me, We'll never be poor again. I am a financial, financially wise from this moment on. And friend, I'm telling you that kind of revelation, that kind of decision, that puts you in a place for change. And that's what happened to us. But it involved repentance. You know, repentance has to do with making the decision. I didn't cry. Believe me, I'd cried a lot about money. We didn't have money to buy groceries. We didn't have money to buy diapers. Ugh, we were just cursed the way that we were living. I cried a lot. But when I made a decision, I didn't cry anymore. I said, that's done. Mm -hmm. That's obsolete. That's in our past. And just like this verse, forgetting those things which are behind, I said that is behind us. We're never going there again. Amen. Amen. But then when you come to Philippians 3, verse 13, Paul goes on to say, not just forgetting the things which are behind, but reaching forth to the things which are before. And the words reaching forth pictures a foot racer. It's the image of a racer who's pressing forward so hard he is so stretched out that the blood vessels are bulging in his neck as he's reaching forward, stretching for the finish line. He's straining. Mm. But Paul goes on to say, reaching to the things which are before, and the word before, the Greek word improthen, improthen, means what is directly in front of you 
as opposed to what is behind your back. You got to say, nope, that's behind me. Now I'm going to lean toward what is in front of me. And in front of me, I'm going to get my finances in shape. And Paul went on in verse 14 to say, I press toward the mark. The word press is the Greek word dioko, which is a hunting term, which pictures a hunter who puts on his hunting clothes, puts on his hunting hat, gets his gear, gets his weaponry and says, I'm going to follow the tracks of that animal until I get it. And I'm not going to stop until I get there. Now, in a financial sense, I'm telling you, you got to put on your hunting clothes. You've got to develop a hunting mentality, and you've got to say, I am not going to stop until I achieve a better financial status in my life. I'm going to hunt and hunt and hunt and hunt and get what God has that is set before us. So you need to know what is that goal? What has God set in front of you? What is God's financial dream for you, for your marriage, for your kids, for your family, for your heritage? What is God's goal? But I want to tell you that as you begin, you need to begin with a goal that is realistic and attainable at all times. Now listen to this. Maybe your financial goal is getting out of debt. That's a big, big goal. It may seem like a mountain, but you can do it. Put on your hunting gear and you don't stop until you capture it. Maybe your goal is to stop using credit cards. You know, it's funny that some people in an attempt to stop using credit cards, they put them at a block of ice where they can't access them and keep them in the refrigerator. Well, that only works as long as you keep it in the refrigerator. <laughs> you know, you can just pull it out of the refrigerator, melt the ice and start using your credit cards again. But if your goal is to stop using credit cards and live a debt-free life, that is a big, big goal that will liberate you. And you can do it, but you got to put on your hunting gear. Or maybe your goal is to pay off your car or to pay off your mortgage. That's a big goal. But you've got to put on your hunting gear. And as you're in the process of attaining that goal, there's going to be a lot of temptations that come along the way to try to get you to go into debt for something else. Or maybe your goal is just to be better positioned financially so you don't live under stress. Or maybe your goal is to be free financially so you can give more to the work of the gospel. That's a very admirable, noble goal, and God will help you achieve it. He really will. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, we've seen this week that the Apostle Paul said, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. That word run, the word treco means I'm diving into the race. And likewise, you have to decide in regard to your finances that you're not just going to sit down back and think about it, but you're going to really dive into this. You're going to jump in the race. But Paul says... I don't do it uncertainly. The word uncertainly means aimlessly, wandering from this to this with no goal, with no direction. You need to have a concrete goal about how you're going to achieve the things which are in front of you. You don't have to live in financial trouble all of your life. That is not God's plan for you. Say amen. 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 Rick, amen. I just appreciate everything you're saying. I think it's so very powerful. At the beginning of the program, I was thinking about that Jesus came to set us free. And when we have shackles on us, maybe maybe you are carrying a lot of weight that, that it's, it's affecting your health or, or your body doesn't move like it needs to move because you, we refuse to exercise or you're in debt. It's like shackles and Jesus came to set us free. And Rick, I appreciate everything you're saying. Well, Denise, you know that we are very different people today than we were when we first got married when it comes to finances. And I hope in every other way too. But the Lord really taught us. And one way the Lord taught us was by bringing people into our lives to instruct us about finances. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what you're doing, ask for help. Right. Say amen. Amen. It takes humility to ask for help. But when you ask for help, guess what you get? You get help. <laughs> you get help. And today, you know, we're still challenged financially because we've got so much God's asked us to do, but we're not in debt. We make wise decisions. And today, finances are not a burden to us. Definitely, there's something we have to think about and we have to measure what we can do just like anybody else. And step by step, we're doing what Jesus asks us to do because of partners, but we make wise decisions. 
And today our finances, our financial plans, our giving to the Lord, this is very, very important to us. In fact, it is so important that Denise and I sat down every week and we review our finances every Friday. We review our financial plans every Friday. We review every Friday our giving to the Lord. This is very, very important. Money is an important part of life, and you need to treat it like it is important. But listen to this. Proverbs 10, verse 18 says, By much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house, house droppeth through. Which means if you don't pay attention to your finances and your possessions, they will fall apart. Then you come to Proverbs chapter 24, 3 to 5 in the Living Bible, and it says, Any enterprise is built by wise planning, becomes strong through common sense, and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. My friends, you can handle your finances with common sense, but you need to stay abreast of the facts. Then when you come to Proverbs 27, verse 23, it says, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to them. Flocks represented big money in Old Testament times. And when you have something that is worth a lot of money, you look to it, you take care of it. And if you don't, then you're being foolish. And I know that you don't want to be foolish. And not only that, you don't want to just be in good shape financially for yourself. You want to be in good shape for your kids. You want to be in good shape for your grandkids. When you're with your kids and your grandkids, you want to be able to buy them some ice cream or buy them a toy without it just stressing you out. And if you're younger and you're just financially strapped because you've gone into debt for so many things, repent. That's what we did. We repented. And in one moment, and Denise, it really was one moment, bam, a new mindset came into our lives. You know, when you repent, Repentance attracts to you a new mindset. It attracts to you the mind of God. Repentance brings to you wisdom. And if you want to change financially in the new year, the Holy Spirit will really help you. But you may need to repent for what you've done wrong and ask the Lord and somebody else for help. And if you'll be sincere, everything you need will come to you. I declare it to you in the name of Jesus. But hey, we'll be back in just a moment. And Denise and I are going to pray for you. Decisions. Are they easy or difficult for you to make? Many people make decisions but don't keep them. In the five-part series, Decisions, Rick Renner will help you make decisions about your diet, fitness, finances, relationships, and your walk with God. If you're ready to lose weight, ready to start a new plan to exercise, to get your finances in shape, to improve your relationships, and to take your walk with God up a notch, then you need Decision to help you actually do it. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $10. This series will help you make the overdue decisions that you've wanted to make for a long time. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase a point of no return. In this book, Rick describes how to take steps into your God-designed future. God is waiting for you to get moving, but He will not take the steps of faith for you. You can do it, but you need to know how. That is what you'll discover in this timely book. Don't delay ordering your copy today. It will propel you into the plan God has planned for you. Order your copy of The Point of No Return today for only $17. Don't miss this special offer, Decisions and The Point of No Return. Call now or go to renner.org. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and I'm standing outside the new TV studio in Moscow. Praise God, most of the interior is already finished. They're still working on Denise's studio, so pray for us as we continue, it's gonna be nice. And if you see the big bulldozer behind me, that's because they're getting ready to do the parking lot. You know, winter comes pretty early in our part of the world, so we need to really seize the moment and get this parking done before the cold weather sets in. But hey, we're making progress and praise God, the studio is paid for. This is all paid for. And I wanna say thank you for being the most amazing partners and helping us with this. And now the project in front of us is to pay off the Tulsa facility. We want to retire the debt on the big office complex in Tulsa because when that's paid off, suddenly all those finances are gonna be released. 
for us to go on more TV and minister to people all over the world. My friends, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, 21, that the lips of the righteous feed many. I know that's my assignment, to feed as many people the Word of God as possible, and I'm doing it with you. Wow, thank you for being a partner. You're part of the giving team that's helping us make amazing progress. And if you're not a part of the giving team yet, please pray about joining us to retire the debt on the Tulsa building. It's not about buildings. It's just about having the space we need so that we can effectively minister to people. We want to retire that debt so we can take the Word of God to more parts of the world where people are crying out for teaching they can trust. And I want to say thank you for everything you do. I want to say thank you for being with me and Denise today. Denise, we are having a good time. Oh, I've loved every minute of it. We've been sharing our testimony yeah. about how God has changed our life with weight, with exercise, with finances, and we have two more decisions, which we're going to be talking about this week. And tomorrow's, well, we had to really work on tomorrow's decision. Don't miss tomorrow. It's going to help you. Please be with us tomorrow. But we want you to order the whole series, which I taught years ago. And this is what we're sharing about this week. But the series is very different. It's very intense, filled with all kinds of practical help, decisions. Are you going to follow through this time? And it comes with a study guide. And we're also offering you my book, The Point of No Return, tackling your new assignment with courage and common sense. Maybe your new assignment is getting your finances in better shape. Well, you can tackle that with courage and with common sense. And Denise has a book. And you want to be unstoppable. What's the name of the book? It's called Unstoppable because we don't want to have that quit, give up attitude. We've got to stay in there and just keep going and win the prize. And I believe this book is going to encourage you in that way. You know, it's the end of the year and it'd be a good time for you to load up on some materials to start the new year with. And so go online or give us a call to order all these things. And when you reach out to us, please let us know how to pray for you because we really want to pray for you. And I want you to put your hand on your heart because right now, Denise and I are going to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, you say that you will give us a mind, you'll give us power. Lord, when we have a, a heart change, you're drawn to us. And Father, I pray just like you did with us in one second, I pray you give a new mindset about finances mm. to our friend and help them get their finances in shape in the new year and this time to really follow through. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We'll see you tomorrow. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there really is power. Thank you for joining Rick Renner today. For more information about Rick Renner Ministries and product resources, visit renner.org. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.